Hello viewers, today we are blessed to have uh, a young lady, yes I call her a young lady, she's also my sister, and then she's into great work that she's going to mention to us ourselves. Her name is Yemi Adamaleku. She's the executive director of Enough, is Enough Nigeria. I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself to our viewers, <laughs> Yemi, God bless you, please go ahead. Good day, Mr. Nero. Hello, everyone. My name is Yemi Atamolekum. Um, I lead a team at Enough is Enough Nigeria, where we work on governance issues in Nigeria. Uh, the whole objective is to educate citizens on their rights and responsibilities so they can demand better governance outcomes. That's what I do as a job. But as a person, um, I'm a, I don't know, I'm a nation builder. I'm a mm. child of God, mm -hmm. and loved by my parents and family, and one that just fundamentally believes that the fact that we call ourselves, or I call myself, a daughter of the Most High, that that must mean something in this day and age, especially in the season where the world is very confused, mm -hmm. seeking for answers and trying, and trying to find something magical. So people are changing their gender, they're changing their, I don't even know, they're doing all sorts of things in an effort <laughs> to find themselves. So it just speaks to me a, a world that's struggling with identity. And so the fact that we, or that I call myself a child of God, I believe must mean something this season. So yeah. Amen. Bravo. <laughs> you know, this Open Pulpit um, project has been on now for almost three years or thereabouts. Thanks. You are the first guest that we describe ourselves as a child of God. Really? And I have always described myself as a son of God, so we have something in common Indeed. to the glory of God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I mean, from I've studied you over the years, and uh, you are somebody that I, I just say, wow, where did she, where did she spring from? <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a few things about your early life growing up? Hmm. Well, let's see. Both my parents are academics. Wow. My father and my mom were professors at the University of Ife, now Obafemi Olo University. That's where I grew up. I spent my formative years. Spent a bit of time at a boarding school in Nigeria. Then my father moved to the U.S. to work at the World Bank. <clears throat> and the family followed. I was very unhappy because I had suffered as a Form 1 student in a boarding school. I had suffered as a Form 2 student. It was time to go into Form 3 when I'd be a senior a sen and be able to not <laughs> to suffer. Oppress, to to <laughs> oppress that. Even if I don't oppress, I guess I won't suffer. <laughs> and that was when my father um, got the job. I made a case to stay back, but my parents were not having it. So we moved to the U.S., spent a few years in the U.S., went back to Nigeria. Mm. I had one more year in high school. I wanted to go back to boarding school. Again, okay. so that I would be a senior, it yes, would be no. a good way to mm. go back to my old school. But at that point, my mother said she would have to buy all, everything I needed. So my uniform, all the things I needed to go to boarding school for just one year. And she didn't think it was a good use of money. Oh, okay. So I didn't go. <laughs> so so I, you have to stay at home? I stayed at home. So I went to a uh, high school in Ife, graduated from Morimi High School in Ife. Of school. <laughs> <laughs> And because I went to, I grew up in Ife, I decided not to go to the university. So I did not apply to Ife, I applied to the University of Lagos, got in. Of school. Started my university career there, did a year, but then the university went on strike. Mm. My father was still in the U.S., so I came back to the U.S., uh, graduated from the University of Virginia, and then worked as a management consultant. Actually, no, after that, I did a master's in London. Okay. In development studies. Yeah. Came back. Worked as a mass a management consultant, was tired of that after a while, and then started working at Jesus House DC, which is how you and I met. Yeah, and so that was over 20 years. 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, 20 years ago, 1999, I remember very well. Worked at Jesus House for a few years, and then I wanted to go back to Nigeria, and I did. So worked in all that consulting in Nigeria for a few years, then decided I wanted to do an MBA. Went up, did an MBA in yeah. England. Okay. Came back to Nigeria, 
to do my national youth service. And where did you serve? I served with a small company that a, f a friend of mine was running that did analytics around elections in Lagos. In Lagos. Okay. And while I was doing that, a friend of mine invited me to a protest in Abuja. And this was 2010. A protest? A protest. And you went? Of course. Ah, it sounded <laughs> like fun. What was the protest about? At that time, Nigeria's president, President Yadua, was sick or dead. We weren't sure. Was dying or sick or, or dead? dead. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very, the three. I usually say sick or dead, but yeah. I like the dying. It was sick, dying, or dead. And we weren't sure. The vice president at the time, good luck, Jonathan, the constitution mandates that in the absence of the president, that the vice president becomes substantive yeah. president. But the because the president was a northerner, sort of as they say it, the northern cabal didn't want the vice president, who was from the south, south, to become president. Wow. So there was a lot of politicking and he was... Um, so this cabal has been on for a long time. He's been on for a very long time in Nigeria, in Nigeria's history. So they didn't want him to become president. So there was a protest um, led by, interestingly enough, another pastor, Pastor Tune Bakari, yeah. in January of 2010. So Tune Wole Shoinka, Femi Falan, had led a protest under the banner of Save Nigeria Group. One of their slogans was enough is enough. Enough, okay. I see um, I, I believe some of my young, my friends wanted to join that protest, but I think they thought we were too young and they kind of dismissed us. So young people then said, look, the likes of Wale Shoinka, who would have been in his, <coughs> excuse me, in his 70s at that, yeah, time, at that time, 70s. Could, cannot continue to protest about a Nigeria that they had a shorter period of time to live in than those in my generation. And so a friend of mine wrote an email in February, I believe, and the title of the email is, Where is the Outrage? And his, the whole essence of the email is, how can, how can we continue to look? while those who are older than us continue to protest and make mm. their voice known mm. about the Nigeria that we are going to live in. And that's what then led to our own version of protest that we then called in office enough. Now, let me quickly mm -hmm. continue and ask a question. Sure. Why did your friend invite you to that protest? Why you in particular? I don't I mean, even for her, I think she just thought it was... Be, well, okay. Because it was framed as young people yeah. speaking up against what they're about Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And she knew I liked Nigeria. Okay. So she knew I was interested and she in knew, it. She also knew you can speak up. And she said, I can speak up. And I'm a bit of a troublemaker. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was mostly that. Because at that time, a lot of young people were saying things were not going the way we wanted it to go. And she thought I would be interested. And she invited me and I said, sure. So we went. So there was a protest in March of 2010 in Abuja. And it was the first protest in Nigeria's history that was live streamed because obviously technology had allowed um, live streaming to happen. But at the time, internet service had to be plugged into power. Oh, I see. So we had a generator. <laughs> so, we could, <laughs> so we didn't have the mobile MiFi's that we now do. So we had the generator, plugged it in. So it was live streamed, covered by every major news platform, CNN, Al Jazeera, BBC, Nigerian uh, platforms as well. That was March of 2010. We had a repeat one in April of 2010 in Lagos. Okay. And the idea was, the protest was to Governor Fashola at the time, for him to tell his other governor friends, colleagues, that young people were not happy. Mm. So after the protest, we kind of sat around and said, okay, we can't protest every time we're unhappy. And then go so, back home. Exactly. So what do we do now? 2011 was going to be an election year. So we thought, you know what, why don't we channel all this young people energy into elections and get them to register to vote, participate in the process. And that's how a protest in 2010 became an organization. That is enough. Enough is enough. It's enough. <laughs> Nigeria. Yes. Now, the, a long time ago, um, the late um, Reverend Leo Madi, mm. I did not that. Okay, yes. I invited Canon. him, yeah, Canon, Canon yes. Leo Madi, I invited him to to our church, Jesus Embassy Ibadan in those days. Yeah. And I asked him to come and speak. At that time, the slogan was, as Gwawa Youth, as Gwawa Youth. <laughs> Papa got to the pulpit and said, listen, folks, before he began to preach. I mean, was a lovable man, mm. the young and the old. And uh, he I mean, served as a um, headmaster at ISI. At ISI, so young yes. people so, were okay. part of so, this you, constituency. So he said to us, let me tell you, you people with the slogan, 
as to our youth now, as to our, is as it go <laughs> It is time for all, for of, all us. of us. Now, my question to you is: Do you think that our Nigerian youth are really ready? Yes and no. Okay. I think yes to the degree that there's a lot of anger. Mm. There's a lot of frustration. Frustration, okay. There's an awareness that things are not the way they should be. There's an awareness that Nigeria could be better. Okay. There's an awareness to a certain degree that we deserve better. However, the readiness to make the sacrifices mm. to get what they want or what we want, we're not quite sure we're ready to make those sacrifices. Yeah, the reason why I ask that is this. I grew up to see many leaders, to know many leaders in Nigeria as young people. Mm. Uh, Gowon was young, Juku was young, even Awolowo, all those people Relatively young. were young. Mm. And when they were young and they got to power, it's like they had vision. Mm -hmm. But somehow, it, it appears like the resources overwhelmed them. <laughs> and so, they, they seem to have lost focus, many of them. Mm. And that's why they cannot disengage any longer. Are you saying, or do you think that if the youth get there today, won't it to repeat itself? I don't believe so. I mean, Tenubu, I think it was um, Ashiwaji Tenubu that says that power is not served a la carte. That mm. you don't serve power on a platter. And you say, oh, Pastor Nero, would you like some power? <laughs> of course, yes, My I friend, want would you like some power? <laughs> Oh, friend, to God. Like some power. <laughs> that um, that what Tinubu said. Yeah, the power is not served. Like so that. what point is trying to make? The point he's trying to make is that nobody gives you power. That you must take it. Okay. That nobody offers you power and steps back, and that no old person. Tinubu is in his his age is. We don't know. We, we don't know, know his age, but he's at least he's at least seventy. Okay. Actually, well, he just celebrated sixty something. Anyway, he's an older man. <laughs> his age is unknown, but he's older, and he's also not healthy. Wow. I'm... And it's not a speculation, it's a statement of fact. And anybody can challenge me on that. He's not healthy, but he believes he but can how lead. How many of them are healthy? Exactly. But he believes he can lead Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Now, and the and I guess the context of that point is that he's not going to step back and say, Oh, I'm slightly older, I'm not in the best of health. So therefore take power from me. Come and no, he's he's not gonna have and that's I think that's the point that, that he makes that power must be Power responds to power. And even in a sort of spiritual context, yeah. we know that. Yeah, power that's, responds to yeah, power. Yeah, that's, that's true. So until young people are... Post, the posture of young people is not anger and frustration. If the post, until the posture becomes one of aggregating that anger and frustration into a position of power to contest for power, we will stay in the realm of anger and frustration. Are you going to be able to go into politics? for elected positions or what exactly is your motive what is the force driving this your energy behind in office enough well as an organization our theory of change is that until citizens understand who they are yes. and the power that they have that they will continue to be taken advantage of and get and not get the type of government that or they, leaders that they want or desire and the parallel is just even about life. And I, I was talking to um, a young lady I met recently about the power of identity. That if you don't know who you are, I mean, an idea yeah. say whose you are, <laughs> the way you live your life and the things that you're willing to cope with or manage um, varies. But if I know who I am, it's like if I know that my, if my father were a billionaire yeah. and I know that I'm the daughter of a billionaire, there are certain things that you will not find me doing that you I will not be at the bus stop mm. for 30 minutes waiting for a bus. When my house there are 10 cars, four drivers at my disposal, I can go anywhere I want. But I'm now standing in the freezing cold wearing a winter jacket and shivering mm. because I don't know who I am. But because I know who I am, that's not going to happen. And it's the same thing. No, no, no. Wait, let's, 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 let's do it. Let's do it. Mm. If you know who you are, mm -hmm. in a shivering cold... Mm. I will not be in the position to be cold. And if you are there, you buy a jacket. You dress warm. There's no need to dress warm. There's a car and a driver. 
There's no need. I see your point now. There's no need at all. <laughs> I, should, I will not even be on the road. I will, there's no even reason why, as in, my driver will be dropping me as I'm coming out of the so car. What I'm entering you, the building. What will you say is your motivation? Because I know that you come from an affluent background. Well, no. I'll say, I mean, in the days that I was growing up, my, we were considered Nigeria's middle class. My parents were academics. So that's Aca not, that's two not, that's academic, not two that's academicians not at that time were not affluent at all. No. Uh, no. It depends on the way you look at yeah. affluence. Anyway, I mean, okay. In Nigerian so, context, they were far from affluent. Well, Nigerian context of that of our own time. They were still middle class. You know, they are, they are more than middle class. Mm. You look at, look, I saw about five universities in your resume. Mm. Good. Do you know how, many, how much debt has come with, <laughs> has come with those degrees? <laughs> you know, father uh, posted to work at the World Bank, uh, took all the family, took them back. That's high class, man. Yeah. That's nature of work. <laughs> nature of work. Nature okay, of work. okay. Then let's... But the, what's, so the your context... present, what's your present motivation for the great work you are doing? Because I've seen you speak several places. I've, used, I've seen you take part in posters and everything. What is really the driving force? Very simply, I believe I deserve better. Amen. Really, very simply. And I don't see any reason why any other Nigerian should make my life difficult. I think that's a good that's a good message for all of us. Viewers, you must act when you believe you deserve better. I do. Thank you for that. Yeah. It's a revelation. I believe I to deserve better. And I'm going to begin to work on that because the resources that God has given us. Mm -hmm. They are so enormous. Indeed. I, I like the analogy of saying, if you don't know yourself, if you don't know your name, mm -hmm. it will give, it call you any name you want to call you. And you answer. Because you, <laughs> no, because you don't know your name. You have so no whatever they call you, you will answer. <laughs> and that's why you know, so funny. When, when you're working, people say, S -s 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 -s. my name is not, so I don't look back. And when the people now come and tap me, I was calling you. I said, what did you say? They said, see. I said, but my name is not see. So why should I come back and look at you? You know, in the days... In the days of our University of Lagos days, mm -hmm. I mean, you are not there then, you must have been very young. <laughs> but there's something called Mumuko. Mm. When the... The, 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 the Jambaitans. The Jambaitans. First year students. The, the freshmen. Freshmen fresh men. from the University, fresh from their college and everything. Those of us who are senior boys, you know, sit at the pottery, and then you want, there's a girl you probably want to talk to. You. <laughs> and then she looks back. <laughs> but there are some people that you can see you tomorrow. Want. I'm one of those people. <laughs> I shall not answer him. But to your point anyway, so the, yes. the, the theory of change of an office enough is that we need to educate citizens. Nigeria is about 22 years in its democracy. So it's as an uninterrupted democracy, a culture of military rule. So people are used to engaging government in a very different way from a position of fear. So the idea is that if people don't understand that in a democracy, you have the power. You have the power to hold your leaders accountable. They work for you. They are your servants. So that if we educate Nigerians to know that the power dynamic is in their favor, then they can make better choices to demand better. How do your parents feel about <laughs> your activities? <laughs> huh. My father didn't get it initially. Because as you said, he had spent money on an education that I obviously was not using. Um, I mean, my first degree was in math and economics. So now I am doing protests. We didn't really get it. But you have a master's degree in protests. <laughs> I have a master's degree. <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing was, when my father was a student at the University of Ibadan, he was a student activist. He was so one okay. of the young Awis, so followed Obafemi um, Aulo. Of course, professor. and Naku does it for far from the street. So, so I think he's, he's come to terms. Um, with the with what I do and how I do it, my mom unfortunately died in two thousand and two, so she wow. hasn't seen. The, she didn't get to see this part of my life. Your siblings? My siblings just want me to be safe. Okay. But I think they get it at some level. But I think they just worry about my safety more than anything. You said your siblings are worried about your safety. Mm -hmm. It's not only your siblings. Mm -hmm. All of us. <laughs> I'm worried about your safety. In fact. I commend your courage, your boldness. How are you able, how are you able to? You're not, you're not afraid of what's going on? You're not afraid for your life? Honestly, no. Are there dangers that you have sensed? Have there been threats on, on, on you from any quarter? 
Yeah, and then we've gotten interesting phone calls. Um, there was a protest we had 2019 for Yeli Showare, who was starting a revolution now campaign. He was, he's been held in Nigeria. His family is in the U.S. He's mm -hmm. been held in Nigeria since August of 2019, which is coming up to two years. He's still in Nigeria. He's still in Nigeria. He was in jail till December. Um, December of 2019. So he's been out, but he can't leave Nigeria. He can't leave Abuja, in fact. But in November, I believe, we had a protest in Abuja. And I had recorded um, mobile uh, DSS or mobile policemen smashing the camera of a journalist and beating up a journalist. And it was on my phone. Oh. And as I was walking away from the place, a truck of more dear secret service or state, state security service, I guess they're secret service, another truck of them came up. As I, as they came up, there were some that had seen me recorded. So mm. they started shouting, her phone, her phone, her phone. So they stopped, collected my phone, manhandled me, flung my phone, and basically took my phone, long story short. Wow. Manhandled me, but I mean, they didn't arrest me. So yeah, it's been interesting, but no. I mean, it's Nigeria. Well, I, I, actually, I know that if, if God has given you a vision or a passion, he will also give you the, the boldness for you to do for sure. well, what, what you've got to do. Sure. Let's talk briefly about the hashtag NSAS protest. Yeah. Were you involved in that protest? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you think that um, the protest achieved anything that was the object of the protest? So a starting point is the protest was not planned. Mm. So it wasn't... But it looked, it looked organized. It was organized, but it wasn't planned. So there wasn't anybody in the back room that had an agenda that mm. this is what we hope to accomplish. Oh, I see. That's what I mean. So I believe it was in Delta State. There was a, 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 a post on social media that a young boy was killed by an NSAS operative. And that triggered a series of protests. We came to find out later that the boy was not killed. But what was significant about it was that there had been a track record of abuse yes. by SARS. Uh, SARS is Special Anti-Robbery Squad, which they're supposed to be doing anti-robbery, but they will, har they will harass you, take you to an ATM, collect money from you. If they see you wearing dreads for a lot of young tech guys, and they see them carrying their laptops, they'll say they're into Yahoo Yahoo. Mm. And just basically harass you based on how you look. What they were carrying. looking for money. They were, for money. they were just looking for money. That's the answer. So they weren't there to stop robbery. They were just there to harass citizens. And especially young people. So that triggered a series of protests against um, the special anti-robbery squad, SARS. It wasn't the first protest. But for some odd reason that nobody can figure out, that protest caught fire. Mm. And I think, I mean, again, to be honest, it was towards the end of a lockdown. People were tired. So it was just really an opportunity for people to just vet. And from Abuja to Lagos, Ibadan, Port we saw all, it. Over, all over the country. But as the protest then evolved, because it wasn't planned, different people started adding to So it started off as a, what we could like to call a single issue campaign. So Bring Back Our Girls, for example, is a single issue campaign because it's focused on the girls, the Chibok girls, that were kidnapped in 2014. But people came with... So, many so people things. started adding other things. So it became a end bad governance. It became stop corruption. It became a lot of other things. That was, it was became worry must go. Worry must exactly. So that was confusing the noise. That was getting government very uncomfortable. So a group of people came together and crafted what was then called five for five, five demands that was tied to police brutality, increase the welfare of the police or improve the welfare of the police release protesters, scrap stars, and all of that. But the challenge be was really because the spirit of, or the intent of government wasn't, wasn't... Um, no, no, something not, was no, not, wasn't... Not, wasn't, what, wasn't government was Government was trying to stop the protest. They were not trying to solve the problem. Oh, okay, guys, yes, yes, yes. So as, this, usual. as usual. As usual. So the same day that they banned, so they, found, they banned SARS, the same day that they banned SARS, the police themselves used a water gun on people who were protesting, shot at protesters, didn't kill anybody, shot at protesters, used a water gun at them, or water, yeah, water gun at them. The same day that they banned SARS. Now, you were arresting protesters, 
and not releasing them. You were beating up protesters. So all this was going on and we're saying stop police brutality. Mm. So a lot of people would say, oh, come to the table and negotiate with government. But a core of the young people involved were saying there's nothing to negotiate. The demands are very clear. Very clear Meet the demands. And I'll give you one example. Um, as part of government's response, they asked every state government to set up a judicial panel to listen to people's complaints. The National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria <clears throat> also set up a panel that was going to be based in Abuja. Okay. And they invited different people to be part of the panel. They invited me to be part of the panel. Now, I had wanted to do it, but then people started talking about the fact that the National Human Rights Commission does not have a governing council. Hmm. And without a governing council, the decisions it makes might not be legal, yeah. might be contested in court. President Buhari came in in 2015. The National Human Rights Commission had not had a council in five years. Oh. So a very easy, low-hanging fruit would be what? Give the commission a council. Yeah. This was last year. The commission wasn't given a council until two months ago. So at that of time, course. when I wanted to sit on the council, I asked a, a law firm, Olani Wajai, to write me a legal brief. About him? His son, Konya Ajayi. Oh, I see. <laughs> his, his father is late now. Oh. Um, I asked... Those have been activists yes, exactly. in those days, yes. So I asked um, Mr. Konya Ajayi to write a legal opinion on what he thought. And he said he didn't think I should do it because I would waste my time. And the government can literally turn around and say, none of the decisions are binding. So I think that was just to give an example of if it was really a government that was trying to solve the problem, you would have given the National Human Rights Commission a council immediately. It doesn't cost you anything. But do you think the gov government really knows what they need to do? Oh, they do. They're just not interested. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. just so the question now is, what's hope in Nigeria? Because a lot of noise we are See, hearing, yeah, mm. do I want to go? Biafra wants to be reactivated. You know, they've just arrested Nambi Kanu today. Really? Yeah, Interpol. Working with Interpol. So he's been extra, he was extra, uh, extradited to Nigeria, back to Nigeria on Sunday. So they brought him out today and he would show up in court on July 26 or so. How did that happen? I'm sure they set him up. And I'm sure it's probably someone close to him that set him up. Well, that's, that's kind of somebody close to him. Probably. And because it needed to be somebody that would know his movements, that would be able to tip off the security. But was it, was it, it was outside the country. Mm, so that's why Interpol helped the Nigerian government. So that's why they brought him back. So it was, I think it was probably Interpol that arrested him. So what hope Nigeria? What hope Nigeria? Well, if you take from NSAS, I think one of the, what a very good thing about NSAS, as you said, was that it was very organized. It showed yeah. that when young people work together and things, have a things, common purpose. Things happen. Things happen. And they can make things happen. Yeah. But the flip side of it is the question you asked earlier about young people, are they ready? Are they ready? Because yes. NSAS happened. Government killed Nigerian citizens. Quiet. That energy hasn't been hasn't transformed into, into something, something to results to, to drive it. Yeah. Because if we take it back 10 years, which is significant for us, because enough is enough the protest was 10 years last year. So on the 10th, our 10th anniversary was another major protest. But unlike the protest 10 years ago, we were able to turn that into an organization that is now in its 11th year. But after NSAS, nothing um, as a force to do something moving forward has come out of it. Do I think something will come out of it? Most definitely. Uh, meetings are happening, people are talking, and that will be shaped into something. A big thing, I guess two things I'd say are big. 2023 elections are in two years. I, I tend not to think, uh, I like not to think in terms of elections. Okay. Because elections are events. Yeah, that's true. And the past, they will come, come and go on. Exactly. And we need and people to, cross cabinets and the same people. Anyhow, kind of the same thing. mix of people. Yeah. And they've started already. I think two governors, in the last one month, two governors have moved from PDP to APC. Can you imagine? So they, they are preparing themselves for 2023. So... 2023 is huge because for a lot of Nigerians, though, it's a focal point. It's something they can see. So what are we going to do for 2023? And a lot of young people, registration opened, voters' registration opened on Monday, yesterday, Monday, June 28. And in 24 hours, I believe about 45,000 people have registered to vote. Young people. 
would, they haven't broken down the numbers, but they just shared the um, but electoral body shared the numbers. Do, do, do those things mean anything in Nigeria? Oh, yes, are definitely. You can only rig an election where people don't participate. Oh, I see. That's true. If people show up to vote and they stay there to vote, it's hard to rig an election. I remember yeah. when Bola gave my uncle to pass some election. We were there. Mm. We were there and um, we made sure exactly. that it wasn't putting for them. Exactly. Uh, that, and, uh, that was um, the, the uh, Bola's election that was Okay, 93. That was cast with, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, our time is fast, Penny, but there are mm. two or three things I want you to address. What will you, in one minute or two minutes, really categorize or enumerate as Nigeria's basic problems? Mm. Nigeria's basic problems. I mean, we talk about everything rises and falls on leadership. And the Bible talks about without a vision, the people perish. Mm. And so we haven't had a leader in since Nigeria's return to democracy in 1999. I think Obasanjo tried to cast a vision for what he saw Nigeria could be or should be. After him was Yadua, no vision. After him was Good Luck Jonathan, no vision. And, and this, of course, are my personal opinions. And um, now we have uh, what's his name? Buhari. Serious <laughs> vision. No, because <laughs> where he's, he's sleeping while working. So it's been a problem to find someone that can cast a vision for the country that people that gets people energized and excited that I am in Nigeria and this is where we're going. Now beyond that, and that's at that level, beyond that, over the years as well, our values have broken down. Mm. So people's sense of commitment to their neighbor or their commitment to themselves. Or commitment to values. And but values is, again, tied to your identity. What do I believe is valuable? What do I believe is important? My uh, uh, Valuing my neighbor's property, valuing my neighbor's life. Because over the last one year, we've seen an increasing amount of killing. And that's human beings. Not, they're human beings killing themselves. It's not an animal. It's not. Mm. It's a Nigerian killing a fellow Nigerian. So we've seen a lot of that. And then, in my opinion, we've also seen religious institutions, especially, and um, I, I won't speak to Islam, but I will speak to Christianity. And I'll see religious institutions not carry their weight. And I say that with all, all sense of responsibility. Yeah, I, I, I share your view. I share your opinion. I... Because at the heart of our faith is love. Mm -hmm. And at the heart of our faith is Jesus who came as man who was also very particular about social justice. So it doesn't make sense to me that we profess a faith that's anchored in love, but yet we see so much injustice, but we are quiet. So much in injustice, mm. so much demonstration of wrong priorities exactly. in the nation that is striving for so many things. Exactly. No good hospital. No social amenities, structures. and then many of the churches are displaying this kind of affluence. That makes so you I, wonder. So, I, so, I, so, and I think that ties into the soul sense of values. What is important? What is important to us? And you, I mean, there's a common joke in Nigeria that says, if on Mondays every member of Redeem is not, because as I say, in a corruption value chain, there's a Christian in that value chain. Yeah. There's a Bible, there's a tongue speaking Bible quoting <laughs> Christian. <laughs> Hallelujah shouting. Hallelujah shouting Christian in that value chain. Because it's it's a process, it involves people. So if on Mondays, members of Redeemed Christian Church of God are not part of that value chain, on Tuesdays is winners, on Wednesdays is Anglican Church, on Thursdays is Baptist Church, on Catholic. Friday, Fridays Catholics, on Saturdays is the uh, MFM, on Sundays is all of the above. The white garments. <laughs> If on every day, the number of religious institutions that we have choose to do what their faith professes, mm -hmm. or what, let me not say that, what our faith professes, that there's no way Nigeria will see the difference. So I think for me, so in terms of problem is that as leadership, yes, from a political perspective, but from a just a simple human, being human, loving your neighbor, loving your God as, as um, loving your neighbor as yourself, and loving your God with all your heart, if we actually just did that, we would see it, it would be manifest in the way Nigeria is, is governed. Because let's not forget, even in private businesses, the way they run, the way we treat people, that has nothing to do with government. It's all in the business. Yeah. I remember before I came to the US, the, I was going to go for my tax clearance. Mm -hmm. 
uh, used to be three years, tax clearance. And I went, I went by myself. And I discovered that somebody told me that if you go to see that officer, mm. you get, he will write it for you. Mm. Just pay him whatever you think you can afford. And as we went there, interestingly, the, the line was so long. Mm. In front of him? Yeah. Interesting. So we had to kill to bribe. Oh, wow. Shamefully. <laughs> now I just told my eye, I saw the official window. <laughs> Empty. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you went there? I, I went there straight away. I paid the money I needed to pay. It wasn't even much. And I left early and I, I went to my office. I sat down. <laughs> I almost wept that day. <laughs> that how has Nigeria come to this? Everybody believed in that. Uh, negative value system. Mm-hmm. Oh. And that was then. Imagine how much worse it's gotten. Because the thing is, whatever you celebrate, mm. amplify. And unfortunately, what the church indirectly or what's and then what society has done over the years is celebrate shortcuts. Is celebrate us doing the wrong things to get ideas. So that's what gets amplified and that's what people so when you do the right thing, people talk about it all the time, especially people who are small business owners, that they feel that they are penalized for doing the right thing. Oh, not just doing for speaking the right thing. Even inside the church, you are penalized, mm-hmm. you are relegated, you are victimized, you are called all kinds kind of, of names, and then they try and label on you, rebellious person, <laughs> you know. But the thing is this, I'm, I'm happy I'm discussing with you because you brought this uh, Christian thing, Christian value into it. How are you surviving as a Christian? In this holy body of demonstrations, meetings, etc. Well, I went with media at the time, the atmosphere was intense. I mean, it was it was dense. You could feel the spiritual heaviness. Mm. That's one of the reasons why I stopped practicing Nigeria before I left Nigeria. Really? I, yeah. Are you able to cope? Are you able to cope? Good as, and just as you said at the beginning, I guess when when God gives a vision, he, he makes provision. For this season of my life, I'm quite clear that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. And God has been kind in making it possible. So he makes it easy. So there's ease. In, in what I do. It's not that it's easy, but that it, there's ease. And how do I cope? I, I don't, honestly don't think about it in those terms. I just mm-hmm. get on, I get on with the work that I need to do. Is a, is a calling, is a calling. I thank God for his message. Is a calling, God, God calls me. So finally, Yemi, what advice do you have for our people out there? I mean, the suffering that's going on in Nigeria, the suffering that, the, the kidnapping, or kind of, horror, so to say. What advice do you have for for people out there? It affects all of us. I think for a lot of people, there's a sense that it's in Nigeria, it's distant. But for a lot of people, you still have family members, you still have friends in Nigeria. So especially for those in the diaspora, there's a responsibility that you have to pay attention. So a very easy one, and I use the word easy lightly, is just to really pray and just trust God. There are a lot of um, prophecies at this time that talk about God being Judgment starting, the Bible does talk about, I think, in, in First Peter, judgment starting in the house of God. Yeah. So there's a lot of that. And just really that we ask God for mercy and ask God that for the things that he's asked us to do and the people that he's called to, to repent or do specific things, that they would have the courage to do what God is asking them to do. For those of us who, I personally believe in the concept of six degrees of separation. There's nobody I believe I can't reach through. If I pick the right six people, I'll get to whoever it is. For those of us who can, we it's in at a certain level, it's people that we know who are in the National Assembly, who are governors, who are state house of assemblies. For different people, you know them somehow, family members or somebody's cousin, somebody's uncle. Begin to put pressure that the way Nigeria is, is not sustainable the way that it's going. Thirdly, for those who want to run for office, and if you're able to in whatever way support them when you see young people medium people anybody who has ideas who has a vision who wants to run for office do support them because ultimately until nigerians determine the type of nigeria that they want and they're willing to pay the price to get it we will keep talking and nothing will change they're willing to pay well there's a price as with anything count the cost the bible says it clearly there is a price well viewers we've listened to yemi we talked about 
the, the first song was Okunimeta, Obunimeta. Yeah, me is Obunimeje. Because I've listened to, to many of your programs and um, and I'm sure I've been blessed. That's it. Um, we've had one thing is obvious. Power belongs to God. And if you're able to eat some power from the of grace, then you are positioned to do things that are very great. But then you must be close to that source of power. And that Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening. God bless you.